thank you for tuning in to Faces of Hope, a series brought to you by the St. Mary Ann Cope Shrine and Museum. Kate Mahoney leads us in candid conversations of hope and healing and inspiration from people who share the values of Mary Ann in their day-to-day lives and work. Today's episode, The View from Kalapapa. Alicia Damien Lau is a sister in Mary Ann's community, the Sisters of St. Francis of the Newman Communities. Alicia finds inspiration in Mary Ann's communication skills based in quiet determination and humility. Hi, my friend. How are you today? I am absolutely great. Thank you. Yay. Oh, how was the sunrise there today? Absolutely beautiful. Yeah. Uh, it's a nice, clear, beautiful day. Cool, oh, too. So nice. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think you and I have really had an opportunity to hang out since we had our slumber party in Iowa, which That's I can't true. believe now is over a year ago, right? Yes, yes. Right and over. I just, I loved being able to share that time with you, but also with the kids, yes. you know? That was I have, a wonderful experience. It is. It's always so great to be with the, the young people. <laughs> so... So what are you up to? What's going, what are you doing with your day today? Well, um, I just came back from um, Honolulu um, probably about 10 days ago. Okay. So, um, everybody that comes back to Kalapapa are quarantined for 14 days. Okay. Even though the nation has gone down to 10 days, um, Kalapapa is trying to keep the patients safe because sure. we still have patients within um, um, the settlement. So I am using one of the um, National Park Service staff's um, house. Okay. So that Sister Barbara Jean does not um, get quarantined with me. Okay. She's doing all the work and I'm playing Mary. (laughs) (laughs) Martha and I'm the Mary this time. (laughs) Oh my gosh, you're so funny. Are you, what are you finding that you enjoy and that you miss just in this time of quarantine for you? Well, I miss being out there with the people and sure. especially with the patients. Um, you know, part of my day is interacting with them, helping them out at their, you know, um, their houses, their yards, watering, you know, things like that, just yeah. being out. Um, I miss my exercise. I miss my walking. I miss the freedom that we have here in Kalapapa. Yeah. So. I'm sure a lot of people would not think about Kalapapa in modern time in the same way of following all of the infection control protocols. So, That's true. I mean, I love to hear that you are still doing that. And of course, I think about standing by mother's grave and the beautiful breezes that come through. Are you getting the breezes? Where I mean, are you opening your window or no? Oh, yes. No, no. Yeah, okay. And, um, one thing I like about um, Rosa's house, and this isn't the first time that I've used it for quarantine, Um, Because she's in Honolulu most of the time now working, um, um, you know, through the computers and everything else at the National Park Service. Yeah. It's a huge patio. So like yesterday, I was Zooming with a bunch of people. And of course, I was out there in the patio and all you saw this beautiful land behind me. You know, it's so open and and, and airy. So it's nice. So, oh, yes. No, no. I don't stay um, confined. um, Yeah. Okay. So which is nice. You know, you mentioned being outside and that makes me think here, I mean, in central New York, more urban population, when the quarantine started in the spring and there were less cars and less people, we saw more birds, we saw more deer. Are you seeing animals creep in more than you normally would or no? Absolutely. Absolutely. And especially since we don't have that much traffic with the park service. Sure. um, we usually have probably about you know 80 staff that are here okay. um, we're down to like 30 uh, because the park service staff uh, primarily they live on topside Molokai oh, and um, they're no longer except for the essential workers able to come back and forth okay and um so what happens is that the deer have taken over I mean one day I, and you know our front porch I was yeah. sitting on our front porch and all of a sudden this deer just comes right up by the um the stairs and looks at me like, you know, what are you doing in my area? Right. Yeah. <laughs> and then jumped over and, you know, went on his way. And it was um, another deer followed right after him. So we have 
they've t sort of taken over yeah. feeling free um, to be able to roam around the whole settlement. Has Barbara Jean like written an entire story with plots and twists for all the animals now? <laughs> well, she's kind of annoyed at the um, deer because they're eating all of our tea leaves oh. our and everything else. Okay, and I keep sure. telling her, I said, you know, um, they're hungry. So yes, we do have to let them eat and, right. and you know, give them the greens to eat. Yeah. Because they may not have it, you know, in, in the um, other parts of the settlement. Yeah. So yeah, so our, our trees are down and you okay. know, you can tell that where they've eaten. They've been down to mother's grave and, and started eating the jade plants, which is so unusual. Oh yeah. You know, yeah. So um, you know, yeah. it just it's nature and you just gotta appreciate nature on the way it is. You know, I hear you saying that and I know that it is inherent to you to have that belief, but that is such a Mother Marianne thing to say, to have this awareness that whoever is taking what you have fostered and brought to fruition is because that's, they're the ones who need to do the taking right now. Yes. And I, yes, you know, I, now, like I said, for me, that's inherent to you, but is it always been kind of how you thought or was that something inspired by mother or like, how did that come to be for you? Well, you know, you have to realize that I've been in community since 1965. And when I first came down before I entered um, to Kalapapa in 1965 is where I really began to um, learn about Mother Marianne, um, feel the presence of her here um, as well as Damien, um, this holy ground. And this is one, probably one of the reasons why I keep going back and forth um, and coming back here and now for full time, you know, in Kalapapa. But part of it also is my Franciscan background. Um, I've, you know, prior to uh, my graduating from high school, I mean, I went to St. Francis High School. We learned a lot about, you know, Francis and his love for animals and everything else. And, you know, so all of that has probably encompassed who I am you know, today, you know, sure. today I was sitting out there Zooming with um, a group that I work with, um, Jim Guys, who um, does um, personal training in the homes with the elderly. Mm -hmm. And so they were out at the park and I was sitting here and all you heard on both sides were the birds singing. And I think they were talking to each other from Kalapapa to Honolulu, <laughs> you know? So, you know, I mean, that really, you know, sort of came through, oh, but yeah. it does make you more aware of the environment and the Aina, you know, when you're in Kalapapa. Mm -hmm. You know, sure. I worked in, you know, New York City for nine years. And, you know, after a while, I just got tired of the concrete city, you know? So you say, oh no, I needed to come back to Hawaii, you know, which yeah. I did in the yeah. 80s, so. Their nature is so important. And I think a lot of people who are now working more remotely and mm -hmm. for whom their day is not so concrete, literally and figuratively, um, I do think a lot of people are finding that they've maybe always craved more nature, but now they're able to utilize it in, in yes. a different way that is, I find it so restorative, you know? Yeah. Um, yes. So I think that that is being expanded. That awareness is expanded for a lot of people, which is great. Yeah. Um, and then one of the things that I did um, when I went to Honolulu, um, you know, we have our sisters at the plaza um, and about 22 of them are there, mm -hmm. a chapel. And so I said to um, Sister Patricia, I said, you know, Pat, um, I hate to see mother's relic in a case. So I brought it home with me. So that's what you see here, you know? Oh my and, gosh. Uh, I know. And so I told, um, you know, father, I said, you know, one of the things that when, when I get out of quarantine that perhaps, you know, we can, um, you know, have some time with the patients um, and um, with her relic, even though her grave is here, um, I, I think it'd be a, a, just a much more, um, um, prayer for Miller if we could have it um, in the church um, oh, where, she, I where she worshiped for so many years. Yeah. 
that's a totally different level of intimate experience and reverence too. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Did he seem cool with that idea? Um, I really haven't talked with him. I just kind of like, okay. him. so okay. when I get out of quarantine, then I will talk with him. Yeah. About okay. That. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. I love the idea. It has, you have my full support, not that it matters at all, but I'm going to say it anyway. <laughs> um, that's great. So you said you went to St. Francis. Now, did you learn about Mother Marianne and St. Francis in the same way at the same time? Or how did that come to be in your formative years? Well, um, you, you, you heard about Mother Mary Ann, um, yeah. but probably not as much as when after I graduated from high school, I worked for three years before I decided that I was really going to enter. Okay. And so prior to that is when I asked to go down to Kalapapa. And it was at that time, you know, with the sisters and meeting all the patients and it was just a wonder. I came down the pulley. I, I took the trail down and um, the sisters met us at the bottom of the trail. And so it was at that time, you know, they took me over to Damien side and Kalawau and then back to Kalapapa where we had lunch. And what really struck me were the patients. The patients came that afternoon. They knew they had a couple of visitors. And so they sang at the steps, you know, um, of the convent and brought their ukuleles and, and brought their voices and, and brought their guitars. And so they spent the rest of the afternoon entertaining us. Oh my God. That's when I got to really um, was touched, you know, by the patients and their joyfulness and, you know, their openness, um, you know, so, um, and that's why I, since then in the eighties, nineties, um, I kept coming back and forth um, once a month, every other month. And then to be twice a week um, until I finally, after I retired in 2012, started coming here a little bit more often. Um, by then our sisters were National Park Service volunteers mm -hmm. and they were getting up there in age. So I wanted to you know, help them out. Mm -hmm. and so finally, probably about three years ago, I spent um, probably three fourths and now I'm full-time here since yeah. I um, closed my business in Honolulu um, in the beginning of this year, um, was really last year. And it was like the Lord or Mother Marianne was sitting on my shoulder and telling me in December, close your business, yeah. you know, call a papa full time. And here the COVID came, which I couldn't go back and forth to see my clients. Um, the, the sisters got moved in March, um, you know, to an assisted living facility. So it was like, almost like Mother Marianne in a sense, she was prepared to come to Kalapapa in the 1870s, not knowing that everything that she was bringing into St. Joseph's Hospital um, about um, pasture, about infection, infection control, was really preparing her yeah. for 15 years later when she came here and saw people with leprosy for the first time. Yeah. You know, it's almost like she was open to, you know, to really learn everything. Well, there is really kind of that human planning where we actually use calendars. And then there's that divine planning that sometimes lines up and more the often than not doesn't. I mean, I know when I was working at Children's Hospital in Chicago and my dad's tumors recurred and my mom needed surgery, I had said to my boss there, I'm going to be going back to Syracuse. And she said to me, now, isn't that where your recovery occurred? And I said, yeah. And so, and she looked at me, just cellular encompassing grace and said, mm -hmm. well, of course you'll go back to Syracuse. And in that moment, I was like, what, like, what does she know that I don't know? You know, mm -hmm. how is that mm -hmm. all going to come together? But by coming back, I was really able to take what I learned as a patient and apply it in caregiving to my parents. And I certainly, you know, developed a deeper relationship with Mother Mary Ann through that experience that I would not have otherwise planned, I don't think. Mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, Alicia, just for people who might not know, what was your business? Um, well, I was a nurse prior to my entering um, and then, you know, went on. Um, and then I was um, um, in New York City um, with the runway and homeless children and um, ended up um, developing um, 
uh, the healthcare system for the runaway children in a clinic. So, you know, my background has always been development. When I came back to Hawaii in the late 18, um, 1980s, um, then I started working for an independent healthcare director who owned and I operated his facilities. So again, I was beginning to do um, a lot of um, healthcare planning and, and developmental programs. So when I retired in 2012, um, he said to me, he said, you can't leave. And I says, yeah, yes, I can. <laughs> but you got to teach my son how to run the business. Mm. So I said, okay. So then I decided to open up my own business, which was Damien Healthcare Consultants. And um, so with that, um, until the end of 2019, I um, helped um, other facilities to um, open up and develop a um, long-term care facility license. And I started working with home health um, um, agencies and home care agencies and doing staff development, doing compliance, doing development and, and staff training. So, um, yeah. I mean, there, there isn't anything you haven't done, really, <laughs> in, in that realm, right? Is there Not something- Not in healthcare, in healthcare yeah. I've, I've been. Yes, yeah. And so and now that I'm in Kalapapa, um, I was asked to help out with the Kalapapa bookstore. So I was helping one of the patients. And so they finally hired me um, because he was getting ill and needed to go out. So then I started running the bookstore yeah. until uh, March of this year when we closed um, all the tours down and all the visitors. But I'm still doing virtually. Um, a lot of times people would say, oh, I need this, I need that from the bookstore. So I'm still, um, I haven't been laid off and so I'm, I'm still an employee. Okay. So a lot of mail orders um, at this point. Sure. A lot of the books, Mother Mary Ann, somebody just asked me for Mother Mary Ann's book. Um, you know, so a number of books, t-shirts that, you know, um, and different type of things from Kalapapa that people yeah. want. I'm, I'm filling those orders. Yeah, I know you said um, that you were sending my friend Emily and her little new baby something. Thank you yes. for that. Very and just, welcome. I mean, again, thank you for being there when she came to visit that she had such an amazing time meeting mm. the sisters and getting just a little glimpse at a different life, you know? Yes. Yes. So, very peaceful. Yes. What, thank what you. is the, you mentioned the parks department and the employee status and how that works. How has that shifted from maybe your first time climbing down from topside to now? What's that? Because the parks, it wasn't even declared a national park until the 70s, right? Under Carter? Uh, the 80s. Yeah, it was 1980 okay. that it was um, definitely, um, a, you know, the national park, um, you know, service. Well, definitely there were more patients that were here. There were probably around, you know, 190, 200 patients that were yeah. here. And that was very evident um, when I started to come back in the um, late 80s, um, the numbers have decreased tremendously. Um, and right now we just have five patients out of the 12 that are still living from the original 18,000 that were sent here. Um, you know, so you don't see as many of them around, um, you know, driving their cars, um, although four out of the five of them actually live in their own homes. Right. And, um, you know, so that is the main thing. Um, the other thing that National Park Service is responsible for is anything that the Department of Health does not do, which is take care of the buildings. The Department of Health focuses only on the patients. Mm -hmm. So they take care of their homes, um, their, the care home that we have here, food for them. They run the bookstore, they run the... Um, not the bookstore, the um, uh, grocery store. Oh, and, right. Um, yeah, the grocery store there and the gas station. Mm -hmm. And they monitor because the Department of Health is responsible for monitoring all the visitors that come in and out and including you know, the contractors. Whereas the National Park Service takes care of every other building that's, that the Department of Health does not. Okay. So a lot of the homes that have been turned over to the Park Service, they try to upkeep it. They're responsible for the whole um, Bishop Home Complex, St. Elizabeth's Chapel, St. Elizabeth um, um, Convent. So this year in January, um, sister and I moved out and they told us it'll be three weeks. Mm -hmm. Well, it ended up being almost eight months that we were out because 
because of COVID mm-hmm. and sure. able to really be here continuously to do the renovations that needed to be. So they redid all of the plumbing, they fixed all of the leaks, they painted both inside and out, they got rid of all of the um, water um, stain and, and rotted um, oh, wow. um, windows, screens, everything, um, staircases. So they really rebuilt oh my gosh. St. Elizabeth's Convent and it yeah. is absolutely beautiful. Oh. Like, not finish, it's livable. So yeah. since I moved back in in October, and um, so we started slowly just going through everything and um, the accumulation of things as everybody's doing, you know, at this time is cleaning. Yes. Yeah. So we were able to send out things that we knew that we would never use. The staff here really didn't need. And so we sent it to Our Lady of Kiao for the homeless. Oh, great. So a lot of extra sheets that we had, yeah. blankets, pillows. Um, and things. So, um, you know, we kept here what, you know, is needed. And mm. so that we are beginning to downsize. Yeah. We're doing that. Oh my gosh. That is no, I, that's no small feat. And like, as you said, it is so satisfying to know that if it's not in use in one place, it can be really, you know, functional and supportive Absolutely. in another. Yeah. 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 Um, so now spending my time in um, going through, I have a lot of documents, of course, on Mother Marianne, you know, going through that and um, trying to put it in some sense of order. If I have duplicates, I know that, um, um, and, you know, I had sent some things to Kristen, I'm going to be sending probably more things um, in case she may not have it. Sure. Um, so, you know, we're just, you know, there's no use keeping it here. Right. That perhaps one of these days, you know, we will be leaving also. Yeah. Unfortunately. Yeah, I know. I know you you have mentioned that before. And it is there there has to feel like the unknown within the pandemic is not necessarily different than the unknown that you've allowed yourself to go to periodically. You know? Right. Um, right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh with the what was I going to ask you? It was related to the buildings. Oh, so when visitors come and they have to have a sponsor and they have to sign the logins, that is health department related, right? That's yes. Is that in any way something that carries over from at the infection control of the time when so many people were dropped in the sea outside Kalapapa? I mean, is that? Well, they weren't really dropped in the sea. I I think that's a. a Well, that's lore. I, yes. (laughs) You know, yeah. Um, What happened was that they needed to make sure that um, they knew exactly who was here for several reasons. I think it was because they needed to be able to take care um, of those with, um, you know, that came with leprosy and all also the kakuas or the helpers. Yeah. But because food was very limited at that time, um, and they expected those that were brought here um, to fend for themselves, and they, they really couldn't. They yeah. really couldn't. And so what they ended up doing eventually was to have rations. Mm. And in fact, some of the patients still have you know, rations from the store you know, that the Department of Health you know, does give them. Mother Marianne talks about that. Mother Marianne talks about, um, you know, how food and and fruits and everything was so limited. Um, And so she would send in orders, you know, make sure that we had enough, they had enough food here. But the sailors themselves on the boats did not want to come. They were reluctant to bring the food, you know, into the settlement. So that was a bit little difficult, you know, for, for Mother Marianne. And what she ended up doing, which I, I just am a, a, amazed by it, is that when she came, one of the sisters had said that, um, um, you know, because Mother started growing vegetables and fruits and trees all over because the land was so barren. Yeah. And um, so um, sister had said, when she came to visit, 
and this was probably about 15 years after you know mother and the sisters arrived here in 1888 and she said there were at least 321 different variety of trees both fruit trees trees you know guavas you know bananas avocados mm -hmm. go trees and everything and um so i said oh wow you know i mean and it, we're still you know, living off um, some of those trees and, and whatnot that, you know, that has been planted. Yeah. Has germinated, you know, here. But I love the story also of mother in the late um, 1890s or early 1890s, where she and the girls, she used to take the girls out to the valley. And it's quite a, you know, ways out, a couple of miles. And um, they used to go and pick um, oranges. Yeah. She knew how fresh fruit was so important and the guavas that grew there, yeah. you know. And, you know, right now there are se separate um, or is, um, um, trees that are so delicious. And a lot of times, you know, we, we, we do have people are going out for us and picking us some of the fruit um, because as of this day, I still don't know exactly where those orange trees are <laughs> delicious okay <laughs> but it's a secret it's yeah. one of the secrets that, you know um but yeah even the avocados you know you you just walk around the settlement and there's yeah. so many avocados. well there's one in the bedroom that i stayed in there's one kind of right outside that window right yes. yeah there's about three of them right three okay them that, that, yes yes, yeah. yes, yes oh that's just yeah, yeah. So few people get to have that experience. And yes, I, yes. I mean, tr I know from hearing it from you and hearing it from other sisters in different decades of my life since I was introduced to Mother Marianne, the story of Mother Marianne and the patients. And it, it was not until I really got off the plane, you know, to a degree flying over. But even really, it wasn't until my feet were on the ground. And right. I, I've never been in a place that more beautifully describes the circle of life than yes. the fruit trees that you describe, the patients who are living, not dying, but living, and then the unmarked graves and those fields. But, mm -hmm. but the reverence, again, to not being a number or a statistic, but being a life and an experience and a story. That's, that so moves me, you know? And I know you've traveled extensively to really share this message with a lot of different people. Do you have, do you have a favorite story or a favorite response? Oh, Anybody? Oh, I got, I've got a lot, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, one thing that I loved about Mother Marianne is that she was a leader. Yeah. You know, she was probably the most effective leader that I have ever learned about, gotten to know um, in, in so many different ways. You know, if it wasn't for her leadership and being able to get people to do what they thought they could never do, you know, the sisters taking care of those with leprosy. I mean, you know, when you when Gibson first took her down to the um, Kaka'ako receiving station and the sisters and she saw people with leprosy for the first time, he thought that, oh, you know, they'll pack up their bags and go directly back to Syracuse. Well, no, you know, he stayed there after the tour. She told the sisters, we have a work cut out for us. And, you know, sure enough, you know, they just got in there, rolled up their sleeves. And it wasn't just cleaning and, and the cleanliness of the place that was so bug infested. It was how she took care of the patients. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was probably the, the most um, important thing. One of the things that um, when she was at St. Joe's and I had talked earlier about, you know, how she had learned so much about infection, infection control. Well, she was, she had, she was the administrator for St. Joseph's Hospital back in the 1870s. And she wasn't the type of administrator that just stayed in her office, went home at night and went to bed. 
in probably the 1870s, one of the sisters had said that at night, after everybody had gone to bed, she would visit the patients, you know, those who had no one to visit them, just to see how they're doing. And so you know that, you know, part of her was, it was a lifestyle. It wasn't a job. It was yeah. who she was, you know. Yeah. Um, do you think the word you would use to describe her would be leader? Or do you find that to be more, a, like, what's the word that you would use to describe the fact that yes, that was her job and her title, but it was so much more about who she was? She was a sister of St. Francis, truly a sister of St. Francis, because yeah. that's what Francis would do. Mm -hmm. You know, that's exactly what, you know, yeah. Too, but yeah. Yeah, she, she definitely, you know, was um, a leader, but, you know, because communication is so important, you know, um, you know, as, as being an effective leader. And one of the things that, you know, of course, she went to Maui after three months of arriving here, opened up the hospital, Malulani. Um, and when she left and was in Maui for a number of um, weeks or so, um, all of a sudden, the sisters kept saying, you've got to come back. The bishop said, you've got to come back. And so she did, she opened it up, named it Malulani after the queen and the queen had really um, um, named it. Mm -hmm. And she came back to Honolulu and the sister said, Mr. Van Giesen did not want us to go and take care of the patients, you know? And so what it ended up, mother went to um, the director of health, um, Gibson, and very calmly and quietly, she told him, you know, you just have to um, remove Mr. Van Giesen. And if you don't remove him, I will take the sisters back to Syracuse where there is so much work for us to do. Mm -hmm. Well, we're still here. <laughs> so, you know yeah. who, who left, you know, yeah. he was calm. She was polite, mm -hmm. you know, dignity. Yeah. Um, but she made her point. Right. And, you know, to you, there is a connection, a deep connection to the model of the Sisters of St. Francis. And of course, I've grown up with that model from all of you as well. But to people in our lives who maybe don't have the same faith or the same understanding through religion, I mean, do we just call that girl power? Because <laughs> like, I kind of feel like that would be applicable to somebody who might not understand the same mission statement or for whom that belief system doesn't resonate in the same way it does for you and me. Does that, I, I, but I, I don't want to, I don't want to be insulting, but do you think that's <laughs> applicable? Could be. <laughs> okay. okay. She had a way about herself. Yeah, yeah, for she sure. She had a way with, true humility and trying to get her point across. Yeah. And she was the one that looked at a problem and did not walk away from it. She solved the problem in a very quiet and effective way. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you have advice in that same vein for people dealing with the isolation and the fear and the various things that are not, I, I hate to overuse the word normal, but so many people are, are saying what's happening to their lives or to their family members is not normal. And we are a culture and a society that tends to do more than just be. And I think mother did a phenomenal job of kind of blending both of those because sometimes just presence is very powerful, even though there's no action. I mean, certainly with many of the patients, they weren't necessarily going to survive, but they could be given great quality of life just by having someone there. So is, is there something you could offer to today's people living in a pandemic in 2020 and heading into 2021? 
One of the things that, um, you know, presence is always so very important. And when you can't have the presence of people, your family, your friends, you still have to be able to reach out to them. Whether or not, you know, we're very grateful for Zoom, you know, for, you know, meetings to go, any type of face, um, FaceTime, you know, with families, um, picking up the phone and especially parishioners who are so far away and, um, you know, are not able to get to church anymore. You know, there's a way to connect with them, you know, to be able to pray with them, to be with them, um, rather than just leaving people isolated. Mm -hmm. And I think that so much of it is going on and a lot more can be done, you know, with it. Um, and the parishes are beginning to feel, you know, yes, they are losing their parishioners, you know, yes, they do Zoom for, you know, services and prayer time, but a lot more can be done, you know, with that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so it's, and, you know, it's always great to pray for people, but you have to let them know that you're praying for them. That's important. Mm -hmm. You know, that's yeah. important. I've never done so much email. I've never done so much Zoom in my life. Um, you know, um, I'm going to FaceTime one of our sisters at the plaza. And I usually try to do that every couple of weeks um, because she's alone. You know, yeah. they've, they've divided them into three separate units and mm -hmm. don't go, they can't at this point go down and visit. Right. So then, um, so I've been trying, you know, to do that with um, some of them. Yeah. Well, you, you really, you so beautifully exhibit what it means to know where the need is and go where that need is. You know, thank you for, for who you are and for all that you do. I really appreciate it. And um, I hope that this conversation can serve to you as much of an honor to Mother Marianne as it is a celebration of all of the sisters you know, and not to dumb it down, but you know, you're my girls. <laughs> you know, I feel so fortunate to have your friendship and your sisterhood, even though it looks different in different ways and has over the years. Thank you, Kate. Thank Is you. there anything that we, I haven't asked or that you wanted asked and answered? Well, you know, I think one of the things that um, mother definitely, you know, had was her compassion or empathy, you know, towards all of the patients here. And it was regardless of whether or not what religion they were, what they were, um, you know, she was a type of a person that did not down any type of race or, or whatever. What she did, she went in, she tried to understand them and she tried to um, work with them. You know, um, one of the things that she did when she was in Kaka'aku was to learn pidgin. And a lot of the sisters did, you know. And so it's like words from the Chinese, from the Japanese, from the Hawaiian, you put it all together and you're able to communicate with them. But when she came to Kalapapa, since about 90% of the people that were here were of the Hawaiians, she learned the language. You know, you hear from Sister Leo Padina's journal about um, every, um, um, you know, 10 years or so, you have these winds that are coming through. Um, and so mother made it a very joyful time, you know, for them. Well, so what did she do? The sisters were coming back from doing a dressing from one of the women and they heard this laughter and the wind is blowing really crazy. Well, there was mother up on the hill playing with the girls and flying paper balloons. You know, I, I, I sit there on our, our stairs and I kept watching and I said, oh yes, there's the paper balloons and mother. And you can hear the children just laughing. Mm -hmm. But, you know, um, one of the things that um, mother had a respect for was for life. And in another story that she um, was told was that she always took the girls down to the beach. 
And one day when they were walking down, they heard a crying of a baby. They reached the shores and all of a sudden they found this poor baby left out in the sun, burnt. She bent down, she picked up this baby. She held it in her arms and cried. The baby didn't live, but mother said, you know, her consolation was probably that she knew that so many of children were being born in Kalapapa. Mm -hmm. And even though they were taken away from um, the women, the families, um, and she was able to take care of them. And she kept saying that each child is a gift of God. And she helped them so precious. Yeah. And she treated everybody, you know, with the um, compassion, the empathy, and the respect. She did, she did offer people, regardless of their age, with that it giving, acknowledging the innocence and the child. I, I, you know, I often think about how many older people were coming. I mean, not old by today's standards necessarily, but young men and women, not just boys and girls, and mm -hmm. recognizing that in so many ways their childhood experience had involved a lot of trauma because of this yeah. disease and yes. because of the exile and the rules and the mandates. And I do think she spoke to everybody, to the childlike part of their hearts and Thank you for sharing that. I had not heard that that oh, story. Yeah. And that's just one more example of her really loving everyone and meeting them exactly where they are. Well, it's very interesting here. The current patients kept saying, you know, yes, she is a saint. Yes, she is Saint Marianne Cope. Um, but she was mother to us all. She was our protector. And so, you know, that title, Mother Marianne, probably sticks out in their minds, um, knowing that she is, you know, St. Mary Ann Cope. Right, yeah, the Ohana piece, right? The Ohana piece, yeah. yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Sister Alicia, thank you for spending time with me and sharing parts of your story and parts of Mother Mary Ann's. And I look forward to having you be equally celebrated when we launch this series closer to Mother Mary Ann's feast day. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Have a beautiful day. Mahalo. Bye. 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 Bye.